Good morning, everyone. So we thought we'd take you through some ideas for creating habitat on your house, which is, I know, maybe a little bit of unconventional thinking because we talk about habitat in the landscape, in your gardens, creating places for pollinators and things like that. As you can see in the meadow, we actually leave all of the plants up and we don't actually cut them back until spring because we want those stems for our solitary nesting bees and any insects that overwinter and also seeds for birds. But one thing that we started to think about is as we were renovating this house, we thought, well, how could we actually renovate it for organisms to live on too? And I think this is probably controversial because some people probably wouldn't want organisms well, living Well, maybe on their we could also talk about some of the things we did to keep bugs out of the house. Sure, we could do that too. So we'll, we'll do this a, a joint episode of what you do to keep the bugs out of the house, but to also keep them on the house so that you could observe them. And one of the things that we had mentioned when we were doing the tour of this house is my favorite piece, I think, of this house is the gable with the birdhouse in the middle of the gable. And that actually also has a camera and we could actually see what birds move in there. If birds move in there, I think it'll be a perfect place for a tree swallow. Well, didn't you say that it this is actually a birdhouse with a human house in the back. Yes, indeed. <laughs> like, I like thinking about that, like, oh, this is a birdhouse and they have an apartment for the humans in the back. We really wanted to design the birdhouse in a way that looked really nice. And I think one of the, the downsides, you know, people will say is that when you have a birdhouse anywhere near your house or if you have a platform, you're going to get bird poop and things along those lines. Somebody had mentioned that they had gotten bird mites like in and around their house. I don't know. I mean, I have two birds that live in the house with me and they got uh, feather mites, but it's not usually something that goes and attacks humans. So that's not something that concerns me. We had a platform up at the uh, common house and we had a robin who nested twice the last season there on the platform. We had Phoebes on the house and we really don't mind it. Sometimes you get like a little bit of mud stains on the side of the house because they make their nest with mud. But in this case, this will be a tree swallow and I love... The I think this is probably going to be a tree swallow, and the reason why I say that is because they actually like to be in human-centric zones, so I think they feel a little bit more protected with humans, and they usually want to create like a nest box that doesn't have any trees in the vicinity, and this place doesn't have any trees in the vicinity. It opens right up to the wide meadow, which is where they like to actually you know, uh, source their insects. It also opens up to a pond over on this side, and oftentimes you'll see them flying over the pond. So my guess is that will be a tree swallow, fingers crossed. Yeah, and, and this is outside. Like that little triangle is no, there's no attic behind it. The actual roof line continues and is flat and it's all uninsulated underneath here too because this is just like an outdoor awning. So there's no risk of birds ending up in the attic or, and even if they uh, poop all over the siding here, uh, the stain that we used is quite easy to clean because it's quite reflective and it should be an easy cleanup. If you don't have a gable, let's say, you could put your nest boxes like and affix them directly on the house and you usually just have to take care of like what aspect you're facing it. Like normally um, birds won't want to be in an aspect facing, facing north. They'd want to be in more like south or east or westerly direction so they get a little bit more heat in there. And um, this is actually facing in a westerly direction and we get some really good light towards the end of the afternoon. Um, but we have a bird box that's actually attached to the common house that faces out that a tree swallow did put his nest in initially and then decided against it because we were doing so much construction on the side of the house. We were replacing the deck boards, we were taking off the roof and everything like that. So I think next year we might actually get um, a friendly swallow in there since we will be, uh, that will have subsided. Now, one of the other ideas that we have is like kind of an unintentional one. So you can see that we have like a lot of, you know, plants out here and things along those lines. Well, one of the things that we had put on here, and this is probably one of the first things that we have fixed to the side of the house, is this little letter box. And you know, there, it's not completely closed, like there's ways to get into here. And what we found is that we have this little mud dauber that created his nest in there, which I thought was kind of cool. 
<laughs> not so cool if you're going to get your mail. Yeah, exactly. You're not really getting mail delivered here. No, as much. we get mail delivered on the road, and this was kind of more of like, oh, if somebody wanted to put their keys or a nice letter or like hang a little um, flower thing off of this. So I, I got this at the auction house, and what did, moved in was like a little mud dauber wasp. And so I was like, you know what? Normally, if you don't irritate them, then they're not going to bother you, and they're not there for the whole season as well. So I could technically take that out and remove it and use this again. But when I see something kind of move in, and if it's not something that I'm really using, I'm like, I'd rather give it to the organism, the animal, the insect, the bird, or whatever. So that was something that I was pleasantly surprised by. Oh, we should talk about these lights too. Oh yeah, so that's a good idea. These lights, they come with glass. So they have glass here on the side, on the bottom, but what's, we left the bottoms out because what also, what always happens is that the bugs get in there and they yeah. won't know how to get out. And they're just, it just becomes a bug graveyard in there. Yeah. So what we did, because even though it's closed off, there's still like tiny openings on the side. And when the light's on at night, they'll find a way in and then they won't be able to get out. Yeah. So we left the bottoms out. That was something that we were very conscious of. Um, you know, insects will, get their navigation system screwed up. So they might think it's like the moonlight or something and they'll kind of move towards the light. And so when their navigation system gets screwed up, it's often because you're leaving lights on that, you know, mimic the light of the moon or stars or anything along those lines. And so uh, we decided one, we're not going to keep the lights on if we don't need them to be on. So I think that's something to consider if you're kind of considering organisms like oftentimes like in New York City right now they're trying to pass a law where people will shut their lights off at night so it doesn't ruin uh, bird migration which could be very disconcerting for birds as they're trying to navigate through the evening hours so we rarely use these unless we really need them to be turned on and when they're turned on as Sonder said we took that bottom seated glass out because then they get caught in there and we'd rather them you know, if they have a temporary screw up of their navigation system, at least they're able to exit properly. Um, and plus, you don't want to be clearing out a bunch of insect dead bodies in there, too. It doesn't make you feel good because it's like moths. It's it's not just like, it's you know, everything. it's everything. It's not just like little mosquitoes or anything like that or crane flies. It's all uh, it's moths and everything along those lines. One thing that we're actually going to be putting on here and we haven't gotten around to it yet, but we'll show you when it's done is that, you know, we finally put our gutters on which is really nice. You probably didn't even see them because they're painted the same color as the side of the house. And we're going to have uh, rain chains that are coming down. And we decided to buy like a little copper bowl that goes under the rain chain. So, you know, one of the things is that you have to affix the rain chain somewhere because if you get a windy day, the rain chain's blowing around. But the rain chain is an alternative to a downspout. And you could actually see the water go around the rain chain or through the rain chain, depending on the, the type of rain chain that you get. And I liked the idea of getting like a little copper bowl. I think we got either one or two and we're probably gonna put one on here and one on here. And what I liked about that is that it actually creates a little vessel for birds or insects to go onto in order to be able to get water. So that was another thing. We have a bird bath back there. That's a no brainer. Um, I've done really shallow stones that have divots in it and um, just a small trickle of water. And it's amazing how many um, uh, like uh, steel blue cricket hunters and little wasps that I've noticed come over there to drink the water. And you think about it, you don't, you forget that like, yes, all, everything, every organism needs to drink water and birds and insects feel much better when it's a shallow bit of water. Like we have a lot of ponds here, but you don't see a lot of songbirds going over to the edge of a pond <laughs> drinking yeah. water. Now, what about mosquitoes though? Because you always have standing water and you get mosquitoes. Yeah, so if you have standing water, I think that's the benefit of like when you have a bird bath and you're constantly refreshing the water or you have something that's a slight bubbler and is constantly moving. So one of the things that I try to make, you know, uh, an effort every morning is when I go out, I'll either change out the water. You don't want it to get smarmy anyway because that's how disease passes from one bird to another. You want to be able to clean out your bird feeders if you're feeding birds through a bird feeder and you want to be able to clean out the water baths as well. So if you come over here, I actually have one of the things with our water bath, it's frozen over today, but in one of these vessels, I have a little scraper and this is the scraper that I use 
in order to clean the bird bath out because it does get like a little smarmy, you know, a little algal and stuff like that. So I have one of these. I'll probably get some other tools in order to be able to utilize it. So let me show you. It's a really substantial frost today, so haven't gone out here, but if I if I could, you know, you'd probably try to break this or wait for the sun. But you could see like bird poop and everything builds up on here. So you just want to try to clean it. And sometimes I'd get the hose or some hot water and just pour hot water out here. So providing these shallow dishes, whether it's on your house or near your house, but I th we thought about that, the rain chain, it's not only like really beautiful, gives you a soft trinkle of water as it's going down, but also if you get those little bowls, that would be a place for birds and insects to come and, and drink. And it's, plus we have the bird feeders around here, so it'll be like a nice little habitat around the yeah. house. Just one more thing too. Mm -hmm. This serves a double purpose, because uh, if you- Oh yeah, tell them about If you that. move this, this is actually the septic lid. So it, it's always good to have access to your septic tank, but most people don't want to have this stupid uh, septic lid exposed in their yard. So what we did is we got a concrete septic lid uh, got a riser so that it sticks up above the ground. And then there's a handle underneath that that you can use to pull the lid off. Uh, but it's hidden by the bird feeder. And you micro cemented it. And I applied the same coating of cement to the riser as is on the patio. So it blends in and it looks just like it was purposefully done there. Yeah, it looks like a design element. And it's funny because I, we had like a little riser here before it didn't look as nice. And I really wanted this bird bird uh, watering vessel for down here. I have a brown one up at the, towards the common house, and uh, and I said I'm going to put it right on here because it's a level surface. The other one's not on a level surface. It's in the garden. That's, it's yeah, a little. That's the other benefit. It's like <laughs> you know you'll really notice that this is out of level because there's water in here. Yeah. And water is always level, so this provides like a a good base for that as well. Yeah. So another thing that we are looking at, and I'll show you the intentional thing first and then the unintentional thing. So one of the things that I, I hope to have is, um, you know, climbing plants up on here. So I have this, uh, I don't know if this is gonna be, gosh, it seems like it's uh, hardy already. This is gonna be a climbing aster, which is kind of an interesting form of aster. And then I have a clematis that, you know, got a little crispy, but I think it'll, it's a perennial, so it'll come back up in this rose seems to have not had any problems with the um, freeze that we had, but hopefully these are gonna be climbing plants. And then Sonder had put um, these little platforms. So we got these, no, they're not really L brackets, but they're kind of these um, platform brackets that you would you know, put like if you were creating a shelf in your house or whatever. So we just use that. And they're these... actually trellis brackets. They're specially oh, made. Okay, cool. So yeah, I made a little plank that sits on top and then you know, a bird can nest back there. Yeah, and so that was one of our other ideas, like usually Phoebes, um, Phoebes and Robins, I think are the ones. You you could potentially get a barn swallow, but barn swallows like to go up a little bit higher. Usually if you have like a light, light fixture or something in the corner, they'll sometimes do that. But I don't know, the barn swallow seems to like the barn, hence the name. Um, but this was one of the ideas that I had. And at one point, Sandra and I had been traveling and um, I don't remember where we were, but we saw this beautiful book and they showed this trellis, this whole trellis on one side of the house. And that's kind of where the inspiration for this came from. And I was like, that's so cool because behind that, you could have a whole habitat of insects and birds and things along those lines. And I know that kind of makes people squeamish, but for people who love that type of interaction with uh, their outdoor organisms, People, I, th I think you would understand what I'm talking about, but I think that the, this part I think is really nice because then this is south facing, south facing and east facing. So the warm up in the morning, get a little heat toward, towards the afternoon and yet still be protected by some of these hopefully trellising plants. And the other un unintentional thing that we had seen, and I can't see anything like right now, but I have some old photos of it is that a bunch of our woolly bear caterpillars, so that's our, that turn into Isabella tiger moths. Because we did this reverse board and batten, we found a lot of like caterpillars that wanted to just basically hibernate up behind here. So we saw, I don't know, maybe like six or seven or eight woolly bear caterpillars up there. And those are the types of caterpillars that 
I still love. Kids love them because they're just like brown and black and they're really fuzzy and they're fun to pick up and they don't like uh, sting you or anything like that. Very charming little creatures and they hibernate over winter and typically they do it in like wood or underneath leaf leaves or things along those lines. And I had seen a bunch of them actually up there and I thought like, wow, it's like we created like a little woolly bear <laughs> apartment. Um, well, it's nice, right? Because the house gives off heat, even right. though it's on the outside. It's a little warmer. It's out of the wind. And another thing that we noticed is that, or actually I noticed it when I was taking off some of the siding of our uh, other house, is that there's a lot of small bees that will make tiny nests behind the siding, even if there's just a really small space. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a lot of board and batten here and it's not perfect. So what you end up with, you end up with all these little cracks. And it, I didn't seal these cracks for now because I'm just kind of, oh, I'm open and interested in seeing what kind of insects can make it back there. And from what I've seen is that it, there's no insects that got back there that really damaged anything. It was just like maybe a little bit, a little bit of cogweb or a little mud. Uh, but it's totally harmless. And the siding in here is not our actual wall. There's a right. plywood piece behind there that has an air barrier and a water barrier. So they're not really able to get into the house if they're gonna get behind the siding. So it's another interesting place where bees can like make their nest. Yeah, that's one of the things like you'd, you'd mentioned, like you see some single bees and that's where a lot of our solitary bees, they might go in like, you know, a hollow stem or in some wood or, uh, you know, or in like in a dirt patch or anything like that. That's another thing. If you don't over mulch something like this, then you'll probably get a lot of um, solitary bees in this area because you've just created a really beautiful bee habitat where they're very close to their food. Um, so, you know, any of these things like you, when you do wood on the side of your house, you get shrinkage and contraction and stuff along those lines. So even with this, you, you may have actually cut it flush to the top, but sometimes the boards will shrink and, um, and create that kind of like habitat. So that was a really unintentional, but one of the things is that you wanna make sure of is that you have that, as Sandra was saying, that air and water barrier and everything, something that is a buffer so that you don't get like a bunch of termites. Or yeah, if you have plywood back there and it's not sealed on the edges, then that could be a problem because then they can get into the house and into your insulation and that's what you don't want to end up with. Since this is all sealed, um, that that's no problem. And another place where you really have to pay attention to sealing is, and this comes to also uh, making sure there's no bugs coming in. I think for a while, we had uh, carpenter, carpenter ants. ants coming yeah. through here because some of this, you know, the door, the reason why we're getting an awning for the door is to keep some of the water off the, the bottom of the door here. Yeah, so we still have to get that awning. Coming. And there's a screen door. But what happened is that that usually rots out right there on the corners. And that's when, yeah, wet wood attracts carpenter bees. Carpenter ants. Carpenter ants. Yeah. And then they'll get in there and get into your house. So one place to really seal is here at the bottom. And what we've done is we sealed the concrete to that plywood that's back there. That's the air seal and the water seal. That way, uh, there's no bugs that can get in. And also underneath here is a little airspace, but there is actually a mesh there so that bugs cannot get behind this unless they find their way through like a crack like this. Yeah, and carpenter ants, just to you know, be defensive to them as well, they typically don't uh, destroy your house in the same way that like say like termites would. So they're not eating the wood. They're just finding like wet wood that they could then just live in as a family. But I understand like sometimes they'll come into the house. That's how we saw them coming into the house because we didn't have the screen door. We don't obviously have the awning yet and it was getting wet and it wasn't sealed because we weren't like ready for that <laughs> project yet. And, uh, and so we were like, okay, this is where we're sealing it. Speaking of sealing, I think we should talk about that on the side of the shed because you and Walt did the extra effort of actually digging down and I could show you here, um, putting this kind of hardware cloth. Yeah, so first of all, the way the shed is built is basically two posts and then the house supports the whole shed. So once we dug down for the posts, I also dug down two feet and I put some really thick uh, metal mesh, which we could see on the chimney side, I did the same thing. Mm. 
and it kind of goes underground and it comes out like an L shape. That way, if ever a groundhog or an insect tried to dig down here, yeah. they cannot get in that shed. Yeah, because you don't want, like, this is one thing that we have, I like the groundhogs, but you like them if they're not screwing up your the foundation of your house because they could technically they dig could under tunnel the, underneath. And tunnel underneath, screwed. and then the foundation of your house is compromised. So it was a lot of effort to, like, actually dig around this, but that's, again, kind of picking and choosing your battles of, like, how you want the organisms interacting with you. And we do have a groundhog on the other side where we're gonna put the rock garden. And knowing that there's a little tunnel there, I, when we're gonna do the landscaping for the rock garden side, I'm gonna just be conscious of that. And I would wanna keep that place as a place for the groundhog to be. So he could be near the house, he just can't be under the house. And so that's a way of kind of thinking and, and saving your foundation. Yeah. W one of our- uh, There's another gap here, Summer, like, you know, for mice and stuff. So yeah. in order to keep mice out of the shed, because the shed is open, you know, they'll find little pockets like this to get in. And what I did is I just put pieces of wood there. So solid wood that cannot get through. And then in the back here, there's mesh. So this mesh um, should keep them out. I think it's, uh, this is quarter inch a mesh quarter inch. is what you need yeah. for, for if mice. If half inch mice could get through if it's a half inch. Yeah, so on the other side where you can see it's open, we have the same thing and it's just sealed all around. No, in, no. Uh, so only insects can get in here. So they might want to make like a nest in here somewhere, but we'll see that in the summertime. You could go anything. with maybe a finer mesh if you don't want like some of the wasps yeah, and like everything. Yeah, like a bug screen. Like a bug screen. And then uh, the other thing too about mice is that they do not like steel wool. So if you have something that's a little bit more of like a hole and you put in some steel wool, then they don't like to get their teeth wrapped yeah. around that. It, the one challenge with steel wool outside is that it rusts really quickly. Yeah, that's true. I think they make copper wool too. Huh. So it's just like the same stuff, but made of copper. And then Here you can see. Yeah. So dig back here a little bit. And you can see there's the, just like the heavy stone helps half too. inch mesh, or this might be quarter. That, that's probably a, half that's inch. a half inch, that's yeah. definitely a half inch. So, you know, the way that works is that there's a little space down here for the chimney. But it also, we like to keep a little airspace there because just like the chimney itself, we like this entire chimney box to also create a draft. So there's air coming in from the bottom here and then it's helping push air up to the top. Yeah. And look, I mean, you could tell that the birds like to sit up there because you could, you could see bird poop now starting on yeah. the side of the house. Yeah, there's no cap on that yet. So yeah, they're that's, just, uh, that's one thing that we'll have to work on. Which and then, brings us to this thing. I guess this is one of our final ideas is that, you know, th these have become really popular. These usually are like bee homes for like Osmia and maybe like one or other two genera of, of solitary nesting insects, but not all of our bees actually nest in little holes like this. They'll nest often in, in um, substrate, so sandy substrate. So when we create a rock garden here, I'm going to keep that in mind because we're going to have a lot of sandy areas where a lot of our native bees can actually habitate. In the habitat around here is a lot of meadow flowers and a lot of our gardens, so that'll be, they don't want to travel more than 500 meters or maybe like a third of a mile away from their food sites. And we noticed that we got a lot of really interesting bees here. And I don't know if you could actually determine what type of species they are, but you could see some did leaves and some did this kind of like grass and twigs. And crazy enough, one day I didn't actually capture it, but there was a wasp looking through here. And I, I didn't identify the wasp because it was a really quick, hot, like two or three seconds when I saw it. And I was like, I wonder if that's like a wasp that that parasitizes some of the bees. So um, I think that you could get a lot of cool habitat. I mean, if we had a little camera on here too, that would be neat, but I would be looking to maybe get maybe two or three more of these and maybe affix them somewhere near on the house. And then that way you could um, have so a lot of habitat. Is that south facing? It's south facing, but do you want it to be or what? what's the ideal? Yeah, definitely not north. I think when you think about bird houses and bee houses, south, east, west, and having some type of protection for it as well, because you want them to be able to warm up. Um, they'll probably be able to regulate a lot better with like the mud that they use and everything to um, plug their holes. But 
yeah, generally not north facing. It gets too cold and you could already see in the morning when we, all the condensation that was happening and the frost and everything. Because a, a lot of times they're still overwintering. So in some cases they might be overwintering or in some cases that they have already emerged. But um, yeah, so this area is very, you can see we have a lot of ragweed that kind of moved in. It's one of the more, I think it's ragweed. It's probably, yeah, it looks like ragweed from the leaf. It's not mugwort. But this whole area we'd want to turn into like a rock garden. So another thing that is a habitat is the soffits here for the house. So you could see here, this is probably your favorite spot of them. Uh, little wasps or not, ye yellow jackets also make their nests underneath soffits sometimes. But if I see a big yellow jacket nest, I'll get it off the house. A lot of the yellow jackets a, will go in the, the earth though. There's you know? a lot of these like black wasps. I'm not sure if they're... They're, they're probably, probably hornets. Yeah, hornets. Yeah. And, and they'll, they love making their nests and their nests are usually not that big. They're like maybe the size of a tennis ball. Yeah. And uh, completely harmless, really. Um, as long as you don't really disturb them, I guess. Yeah, I wouldn't freak, like I would, I would definitely, if there was maybe a wasp nest on this side, I wouldn't freak out very much because we're not really walking and playing around here. But if it was like right above our door, that's a problem, you'd have to move that. But I generally have not had any problems with like, you know, if you don't attack them, they're not gonna attack you. So if we don't have any plans on doing that. So I know we probably have a bit more of a laissez-faire uh, attitude about this, but we we are interested in having the habitat and like and observing that and and knowing that we this house could actually provide surface area for something other than like humans. So I think that's kind of cool, and maybe these are some ideas for you for your house, and also ways to kind of not have uh, animals become pests in your house as well, because I think those two like go hand in hand. And uh, if you have other further ideas, like please let us know because. I'm sure people watching this video would love to read some of those comments about how you're actually creating habitat on your home as well. And uh, yeah, on to the next video. See you next week. If you find yourself enjoying our videos, consider liking, subscribing, and even tipping. 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds are reinvested back into community-based projects in the Finger Lakes region. And that's matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. So even by watching and supporting, you're helping us and the community. See you in the next video.